Welcome to the NSGC Industry SIG webinar, GCs in Business, the first of a series of three webinars for GCs that are exploring new or evolving roles in industry. In this introduction to the many roles GCs can take on in business, our learning objectives are to, one, summarize the business life cycle and organizational structure of a startup versus a large corporation, two, list transferable skills that are applicable in the multiple roles that GCs can fill in business settings, and three, identify tactics and resources that can be leveraged in researching and applying for a role in business. Jill Davies and Shannon Kieran will be joining me in presenting this webinar. The three of us have over 30 combined years of experience in industry roles, from building and leading programs at large companies to starting companies of our own. First, I'd like to introduce Jill Davies. Great, thank you, Sarah, and hi, everyone. Um, so I've been tasked to talk today about some of the foundational knowledge, so some of the basic terminology in business. Um, I apologize that this might be the more dry, uh, kind of fundamental uh, part of the presentation today, but I'll try to, to make it as least dry as possible. Um, Sarah, if I can have the next slide. Great. So I'm going to start just by outlining um, four major business formation types. So these would be the most common business formation types, and they're kind of different iterations and versions of this. But um, the first different, uh, the first type of business that you can sometimes hear about is a sole proprietorship. Um, as this would sound, this is one owner and one operator. Um, it doesn't mean that's the only person working at the company, but typically only one owner involved in a sole proprietorship. Um, this type of business has pretty minimum requirements to get off the ground. Often the individual is uh, taxed um, both on personal and corporate, kind of through the same social security number. Um, this is a business that's pretty easy to dissolve, um, not a lot of legal and cost uh, requirements to get this off, off the ground. And uh, many of you as genetic counselors may sort of uh, work in um, independent contracting roles or may do project-based work where you're invoicing for your time. Um, this essentially would be what you're doing uh, for, that, for that type of business. Um, similarly, a partnership uh, is set up in quite the same way, but rather than there just being one owner, there would be two or more individuals who enter into an agreement to operate a business together. Um, still pretty simple and inexpensive to establish this type of business. So again, not a lot of uh, legal costs or, or um, challenges to get uh, off the ground. There can be some more challenges here with kind of tax um, and liability issues because it's all being split by the multiple partners. Um, at any point, you may see a sole proprietorship or a partnership become a corporation. And this typically happens based on the size that um, that that company is growing to. When you incorporate a company, um, that really means that you're separating the corporation from the individuals from a legal and tax uh, perspective. Um, so what this does is it provides the owners with a lot more legal rights. Um, they have less liability. So for example, if that corporation um, get sued or goes bankrupt, then that's separated from those individuals um, and their personal liability. Um, in this case, there's often much more accountability. So once you get to the size of an, a corporation, um, there's more government oversight. You often have to appoint a board of directors and have regular meetings with the, that board. Um, and the other thing here is that income will be taxed at both the corporate level and the personal level for owners. So um, the final um, type of business that often, and I think probably for most people that work in our industry, um, companies are often set up as a limited liability corporation. And so this um, has very similar advantages to a corporation. So um, kind of the legal protection uh, for the owners. Um, but has added tax benefits that are more like a partnership. So without going into too much detail um, at a high level, that's what an LLC would be. Um, and then the other big difference here is that LLCs are typically owned by a variety of different entities. So it could be individuals, it could be trusts, it could be other corporations. Um, next slide, Sarah. 
Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about in my section would be the business life cycle. Um, and we can dive into each of these stages uh, more deeply, but for the most part, um, there are four uh, different stages in the business life cycle. And for those of you who work for companies, um, you're likely, you've likely been involved at various stages of growth uh, in a company, um, one or more of these stages. Um, this slide, again, only shows four stages. I would argue that some of these could be broken down a little bit further, and I'm going to do that as we talk through uh, each of these stages today. Um, next slide. Um, so the introductory phase, this can often be quite a long phase, and I like to personally break this one out into two phases. So um, the pre-market or startup phase is, is really the earliest stage of any company where you're really just starting to get a concept off the ground. So kind of thinking through what is the strategy, the who, the what, the, how, the why, the how. Um, thinking through are you building something, buying something, licensing something. Um, also really important here to be thinking through a budget. So um, whatever product or test or service you're bringing to market, how much is it going to cost to get there? Uh, what timelines um, would that align with? And then how long really is it going to take you to kind of generate uh, any revenue from that, um, from that offering? And those are going to be really important to nail down and be able to articulate because most often at this stage, you need to go out and raise some money to get your business idea or your business and, and company off the ground. Um, and being able to articulate the budget and timelines is going to be really important for investors before they'll make a decision uh, to come and invest in the company. Um, usually in the startup phase, there's also a lot of product development. So whether you're developing a software product or a lab test, um, really kind of developing and improving out this concept. Um, there's also brand development that goes in at this stage. So usually at the very early stage, um, a company hasn't been named. There's no website. There's no logo and no kind of positioning and, and mission. And all of that gets developed and formulated at this really early stage. Um, as well as the legal and regulatory stuff. So again, kind of registering the business, setting it up um, as one of those four different entities that we talked about earlier. Um, and also really starting to think through what some or who some of the key hires uh, you would need to put in place as a business to kind of get the company um, operational and profitable and moving forward. Um, next slide. At this really early startup phase, um, certainly one of the most important things is having capital or, or money to help uh, get the company started. Um, very early, we typically call this seed capital. So that's a small amount of money that can really help to get the company seed sprouted and, and get it growing. Um, depending on the size of the company, there are various funding sources. Um, some early companies and, and certainly sole proprietorships and partnerships may be self-funded or they could be um, drawing on friends and family to support the early stage investment of a company. Um, very often in the seed phase, and again, it, it depends on how much capital is needed, um, angel investors will come in and angel investors are either individuals or groups of high net worth um, people, so uh, often wealthy individuals that maybe have a vested interest in what you're building. Um, we're seeing a lot of um, angel investors that are looking for what's called impact investment. So they really want to invest in businesses that are making an impact, um, maybe changing healthcare outcomes or, you know, in, in other areas, um, having a societal or environmental impact. Um, another way to get funding in the early stage would be through a venture capital group. Um, so venture capital uh, is, is typically a much larger firm, and they usually are coming forward with larger sums of money in the early stage. Um, so if a company only needs a, a couple hundred thousand or so to get started, a venture capital is, uh, firm is not likely to be very interested in that. They want to come in where there's a high risk investment that they'd be taking, but also a high reward likely on the back end. So they can often come forward with a lot of capital. Um, but because of that, they also usually take some uh, control over the company decisions, as well as significant ownership in the company. So, you know, if you're starting a business or if you're involved in a business at the early stages, those are some of the things to think about um, when you're when you're um, kind of walking through what different types of funding that you may be looking for. Um, 
A final one that I want to touch on, which is a little bit more unique, um, is something called an incubator or accelerator. And we're seeing a lot more of these in the, in the biotech and tech space where um, companies, uh, their whole business is to help entrepreneurs uh, get new businesses off the ground. And what they do is provide access to individuals or, or teams of people to various things. So it might be funding, it might be access to a network of investors, it might be access to um, some shared resources, kind of legal and finance people that can really help get that business started quickly um, and accelerate the growth. And so, um, next slide, Sarah. Great. Um, and so, as I mentioned, I like to break down the introductory phase uh, into two. So we talked about kind of the pre-market phase. Um, the next phase is really taking uh, the company and the product to market. So this is once you've completed everything on the previous slide, the business plan, the naming, the product. Um, and at this stage, you really want to be tight on kind of who you're selling to, how you're going to be acquiring customers, how you're going to be generating revenue. So there's a lot of strategy and focus at this stage, and then also really beginning to execute on that strategy. Um, very often there's some continued product development at this stage. So while in the pre-launch phase, um, there's likely to have been some product development, it's usually a, a beta version or a proof of concept at that phase. And so here, you're continuing to build on that product, you're getting some customer feedback and improve on, on what it is that you're delivering and building. Um, typically, as you get towards the end of this uh, startup phase, the introductory phase, um, the money starts to run out from the seed fund. And so um, often individuals will go back to either those uh, seed or angel investors um, or if it comes to a point now where, where there's a larger amount of capital that needs to be raised to kind of get things moving, um, it might be a Series A. Um, and in that case, that's again a larger sum that would often be a venture capital or a, a, another group of high net worth individuals that would um, provide that funding. Um, next slide. So the growth phase in a company, um, in my opinion, this is usually the longest phase. So this is when a company is really starting to grow in size, grow in revenue, grow in market share. Um, the focus here is really at getting to break even, or if you're lucky, uh, becoming profitable. Um, and this can, I, I want to just reiterate, this can really take a long time, especially if you think that, you know, in the early stage, millions have been invested to get your product to market. Um, it can really take a long time to get to the break even or profitable. But it's also where the company is starting to kind of prove its worth to investors. You're getting some traction. Um, you know, investors are, are getting quite interested. They may even be starting to get, um, get some of their investment back at this stage, depending on how their arrangement is set up. Um, the other thing that you can often see happen at this stage is a lot of um, churn and turnover in the leadership of a company. And I'm sure that many of you who work in industry have been through this before. It's not necessarily a bad thing when you see leadership changes uh, in this stage of the company. It typically just means that, um, you know, the skills and the experience that's required in a leadership team at this growth phase and especially getting into maturity could be quite different than what was required at the early phase when the company was just um, getting started. And so again, if, if this is happening in an organization that you've been in, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's, it's very, very common. Um, and it might also mean at this point that they're getting the company ready uh, for a sale or taking it public. Um, typically at this stage, um, if additional capital is needed to get through that growth phase and into the maturity phase, um, the company may go out and raise a Series B or maybe even a Series C or D. Um, the other thing that can sometimes happen here is you get uh, someone come in that would be considered a strategic investor. Um, what this means is uh, another company or another entity is coming forward with some money because, and, and usually they do this because they have seen some value in your business long term that they might want to acquire. So it aligns with their business in some way. And that's very common um, to see happen in this phase of the company. Next slide. 
Um, so kind of thinking longer term, what are the different ways that companies can either continue to grow and operate or maybe um, exit? And so there's a, kind of a few different things that could happen here. And again, it depends on how the business is structured and what the long term goals are and whether it's an individual or a corporation that owns it. Um, some companies just continue to kind of grow and mature and actively manage that growth. Um, you know, once the company is uh, profitable, then its owners really start to earn um, additional revenue and, and uh, share in that in that growth. And so, some individuals or groups just want to keep growing and managing that company in a privately held way. Um, what we're often seeing in our space and genomics and biotech in general, um, we're seeing a lot of mergers and acquisitions happen. So companies that are buying other companies. Um, and again, this could happen. Um, I had mentioned strategic investment on the earlier page. Um, this can happen because uh, someone is very interested in your business. Um, they saw some sort of alignment and they want to now acquire you completely and bring you into their company. Um, sometimes you'll also see a competitor that will uh, acquire by another competitor. Um, sometimes this is to remove them as a competitor from the market. Um, other times it's because they have technology or maybe intellectual property that is of interest. Um, and sometimes it's because they have a really big share of the market um, and that competitor wants to access that uh, additional market share. Um, finally, what can sometimes happen at this stage um, is a company can be acquired by a private equity firm. So like we talked about with venture capital groups, um, private equity groups are firms with, that typically have a lot of money. Um, they don't usually come in at the very early stages where there's still a lot of uh, early risk. They often will come in and acquire a company when it's profitable, and their goal is to make it more profitable. Um, Sometimes their goal is to merge it with other companies that they already own. Um, but if you hear about private equity, that's typically what, uh, what is happening in those types of deals. Um, and then finally, uh, we often also hear a lot about companies going public in our space. So initial public offering or IPO. Um, this essentially means that a company is now being publicly traded on the stock market. Um, anyone can go and purchase stock and have ownership. And it's a way to bring in additional uh, capital or money, but it also comes with a lot of um, oversight and, and kind of reporting back to the shareholders. Um, next slide. Great, so we've talked about um, different business types and how they're formed, and we've talked about the business life cycle and touched a bit on kind of funding sources. Um, the final thing I'm gonna talk about is organizational structure, corporate structure. So how companies and teams are built and, and structured inside an organization. Um, and this can really vary from company to company. Um, and, and sometimes the structure is more or less formalized. Um, generally speaking though, you're always gonna have an executive team or person uh, at the top of this um, chart or, or pyramid. Um, and they will usually report to a board of advisors. Um, so again, not often or not always with a sole proprietorship or partnership, but most companies, uh, the executive team will have a board of advisors above them. Um, and those are often paid positions. There are often uh, individuals who are involved in decision making at the corporate level. Um, and often or sometimes they have money invested in that entity as well. Um, next slide, Sarah. Once you get beyond kind of the executive team and the board, um, beneath that, companies can be organized in a variety of different ways. So you'll see some companies that are structured uh, functionally. And so what that means is that um, there are teams of people that have related skills or functions. So there'll be a finance team, a scientific team, a commercial team. Um, and then there'll be tiers of leadership within each of these functional teams. And so the reporting structure is usually up to someone within your own team uh, in this type of structure. Next slide. Um, you'll also see companies organized divisionally. And so um, especially large labs in our space, you may see that they're organized with uh, a prenatal division and an oncology division and so on. Um, in these cases, these are almost operate like mini businesses uh, in themselves where each team will likely have a finance group, a sales and marketing group, 
Um, but the reporting is up to someone within the same division. So usually it's a president at the top of each of these divisions that um, the team would report up to. Next slide. Um, I think probably what's most common, and we see a lot of companies moving more to this matrix structure. Uh, this is my personal preference, where you have multiple cross-functional and cross-business unit groups. Um, so often in these um, types of scenarios, the individuals within the matrix will have more than one manager. So they may have a solid line uh, reporting relationship to one person, but some dotted line reporting relationships to other people. Um, the great thing about this type of model is that the, the employees in these um, organizations have more variety and exposure. So they're working on multiple different products across different cross-functional teams. Um, so more exposure to the business and to different people uh, within the company. Next slide. Um, and the final way that um, companies can be organized uh, would be a flat structure. So this is where there are really very few or even no levels between a management team uh, and the staff. Um, typically, there's still going to be some executive team or, or person who's making leadership decisions and strategic decisions, but um, there's often no direct reporting structure beneath that. So this type of structure really empowers employees to be their own boss and make their own decisions and hold themselves accountable. Um, usually in this type of structure, uh, leadership, especially as these groups grow, they have a lot of direct reports. Um, and so it can be challenging to manage as companies grow, but it can provide for a lot of autonomy for uh, people who really like to be independent um, at work. So you see a lot of engineering companies that are set up this way as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Shannon Kieran, and she'll take it from here. Thanks, Jill. Hi, I'm Shannon Kieran, and I'm going to talk today about how the core competencies of genetic counselors lend us to diverse roles in business. First, I'd like to acknowledge that DCs are now working in all sorts of diverse roles. Um, according to the 2018 NSGC Professional Status Survey, just over half of all DCs report being in a role that involves primary face-to-face -face counseling. So clearly, there's a lot of other roles that GCs are filling in the work environment. And really, that's not a surprise. So many of the skills that we learn in training and in practice as GCs transfer very nicely to expanded roles, um, making the GC workforce a desirable group. The fact um, that this, this is the fact is not gone unrecognized by many industries. So this slide here shows a handful of the companies that have decided to employ genetic counselors in business roles, um, where the majority of their time is not involving face-to-face -face genetic counseling. These industries range from biotech to health insurance to sequencing manufacturers, um, all the way through government and regulatory agencies. So let's refresh our memory on what the ABGC considers the core competencies for our professional practice. Um, these four domains describe a wide set of skills required to be a genetic counselor, but they reach far beyond our expertise in medical genetics. Um, these transferable skills are taking GCs into new and exciting roles, um, according to the NSGC. So this quote is from the 2018 Professional Status Survey. Many of the roles on this slide may look familiar to you, but some, such as web content development, public policy, and consulting may not be as familiar. We could call these up and coming areas for our profession. But how does somebody get into a business role like these? Is there a defined path? I think that the answer is no. There's not a defined path for getting into a business role as a GC. But it turns out that this is actually not unique to business roles. In fact, according to the NSGC Professional Status Survey, uh, less than one third of GCs report having an established career ladder. However, the good news is that when surveyed, GCs in non-direct patient care roles were the only group more likely to have a defined career ladder than not. So perhaps once the genetic counselor is in a business role, the path up becomes clearer. So let's explore some of these business roles. and how they match well to the core competencies. 
So GCs with strong core competencies in genetic expertise and analysis excel in demonstrating their depth of knowledge pertaining to genomic principles and critically assessing information related to genetics and genomics. GCs who excel in these areas may find a product development role to be very satisfying. Product development includes analyzing gaps in available products and services, as well as building the components of new products or services. Tasks that may be involved in product development include genetic curation, analysis of product utility, and sometimes even product design work. GCs who really enjoy the interpersonal and psychosocial components of the field may excel in roles that require a lot of active listening, empathy, and interviewing skills. Strong communicators with an empathetic ear fit well into roles in the human resource department. It may seem like an odd title for a genetic counselor, but if you think about what human resources does at a company, it really is about providing human support, both medical and non-medical. If you take a look at job openings in HR, you might be surprised how interesting and satisfying these roles can be, even for a genetic counselor who came from a clinical training background. As genetic counselors, educating people about genetics is the core demand of our profession. So of course, this is one of our core competencies. A rare few of us have escaped having to learn the art of digesting very complex information and teaching it or conveying it back to non-medical folks. For those GCs who really enjoy the challenge of simplifying complex information and expressing the gravity of such information, a role in marketing may be a good fit. To excel in a marketing role related to genomics, GCs must be available um, and able to thoroughly understand the details of the product or service that they represent. But also, they have to be able to concisely summarize and, um, and digest the most important parts of that information and present it back to diverse audiences in a way that compels them to act. The fourth area of ABG's, uh, ABGC's core competencies involve professional development and practice. Um, many of the skills involved in this competency, such as developing work relationships with cross-functional teams and um, taking serious the responsibility of being a supervisor, lend to roles in management. This could mean managing a team in a clinical setting or it could be more broadly applied in a business setting. One important thing to remember about managing people is that managers don't need to know how to actually do the job of the employees that they supervise. So my advice is not to get trapped in the thought that a GC should only manage other GCs. The real role of a manager is to support their staff and enable them to do their best work. So interpersonal counseling skills don't hurt in this department either. Other interesting business roles that GCs are already filling um, include business development, sales, and policy advisory roles. So if you really enjoy networking and connecting with new people and teaching them new things or sharing new ideas, you might enjoy business development. If you enjoy education and thriving on a little friendly competition, you might enjoy the challenge of a sales role. One thing to keep in mind is that roles in business development, sales, and marketing do often come with performance metrics, which is something that most GCs are not accustomed to being judged on or compensated on. Finally, if you gravitate towards compliance, um, enjoy writing, like to establish rules, boundaries, um, standard operating procedures, then you may do well in a policy or um, ethical, legal, social implication advisory role. Okay, so to recap, there is no shortage of business roles for GCs in the workplace. But as you think about moving into a new business role, do beware of imposter syndrome. For those of you who are not familiar with this term, um, imposter syndrome is the feeling that you've just been lucky and not really earned your achievements or believing that people think you are smarter than you really are. More women than men are affected and people who are high achievers within their peer group are also more likely to experience imposter syndrome. So if you find yourself thinking thoughts like, why would a company want to hire me? Make sure that you're not succumbing to a case of imposter syndrome. Remember, we as GCs have a core set of skills that translate well across many roles. So my advice is that 
if you're going out for that promotion or new role, keep calm and GC on. So just to summarize my thoughts, first, remember the genetic counselor training and practice has set up our profession to transfer well across a lot of business roles. Second, look inside yourself and be honest about your strengths within the core competencies of genetic counseling, but also consider your interests and your passions. Look for jobs that match you in both areas. Third, go beyond the NSGC job connection when you search for your next role. Maybe even connect with a recruiter. Last, talk with friends or colleagues that are already in a role similar to what you're seeking and ask them to mentor you. Everyone needs a champion. In fact, they may even already have a role open that could be yours. Thanks for taking time to listen to me today and good luck out there. I am going to pass this on to Sarah. Thank you, Shannon. Well, now that Shannon has walked us through some of the different roles that GCs can play in business, let's talk about how to find the right role. And if the right role doesn't exist, how to create one yourself. When you're assessing a new opportunity, there are several categories by which you may want to evaluate that new potential role. Company culture. How financially healthy is the company? What compensation and benefits will they offer you? And what are the opportunities for your personal and professional growth? Let's go through how to best evaluate each. When determining whether you want to work for a new company, company culture is by far one of the most important attributes to assess. Peter Drucker, one of the most well-known and influential thinkers on management theory and practice, famously coined the phrase, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And truly, an intentionally positive and productive company culture is not only a predictor of a company's success and performance, but a measure of employee satisfaction. A recent Glassdoor survey found that a positive company culture and values was a primary indicator of employee retention. So culture matters. What's the best way to assess company culture during the interview process? Well, at a startup where the culture is largely driven by the founders and the founders are likely still heavily involved in the company, try to interview with the founder or at least ask to be introduced to one, to one of the founders when you're on site for your interview. You'll get a good grasp of the, of the mission and vision by which the company was founded upon. Because startups tend to be small but have big goals to achieve, the pace of work can be quite demanding and often the expectation is to put in more than eight hours a day. You can get a good idea of the pace and flow of the workday and the general company culture by asking questions like, what's the typical workday like in the office? Do people come in on nights and weekends? Do people work from home? What's your favorite thing about being an employee here? What are some of the challenges? Do people hang out together outside of the office? While, they, while these may not be typical questions to ask during a formal interview, you can ask them in casual conversations with other employees you meet in the lunchroom or break room when you're on site for your interview. I've been involved in several startups, and I can tell you that inherent in any startup culture is a comfort level with uncertainty. It is, after all, a startup still trying to prove itself. The product is still often being defined. There are usually many pivots and trajectory and goals, and sometimes the next funding cycle is uncertain. Some people find this incredibly exciting and thrive in this culture. Others who crave more stability do not. So it takes some self-awareness to evaluate where you stand. Culture at a larger, more established company is equally important, but there may be more than one culture to assess. The culture of the larger, larger organization that is driven by the C-level executives and the culture of the smaller division or team that you may be working with. So during the interview process, it's important to try to speak with as many people as possible, both inside and outside of the department that you may be working with. Many of the questions that you'll want to ask are similar to what you would ask at a startup. What's the typical week at the office like? Do people work from home? What's the best thing about working here? What are some of the challenges? At a larger company, the role you may be considering may have already been established and you will be replacing someone else. In that case, it's very important to understand why the previous person is leaving the role. With larger companies, you can also use external, uh, external sources to your advantage in assessing company culture. What do employees and members of the public say about the company on Twitter or LinkedIn? An even better resource is Glassdoor, where employees can submit anonymous reviews of their company so are enabled to be quite honest. 
Besides a healthy culture, you'll definitely want any company you join to be financially healthy. For a startup, this comes down to funding, runway, and revenue. Jill discussed the different funding rounds that a startup may go through, from early, from early stage seed funding to later growth rounds like Series A, B, and so forth. It's really important to understand when considering joining a company what stage they're in. How much have they raised and when was the last round? What's the runway for their current round and how soon will they need to raise again? Are they close to making significant revenue? A simple way to ask this is do you have customers and are you making sales? Never feel bad about asking these questions. This is, this is critical information for you to have. Generally, if a startup is hiring, they are in a relatively good place and have a significant amount of runway. If a company is publicly traded, there are publicly available reports that you can reference to determine whether the company is meeting its financial goals. All publicly traded companies in the U.S. must file regular financial reports with the SEC. These documents will be, will be available in the Investor Relations section of a company's website, along with shareholder newsletters. Despite being well-established and profitable, many companies will choose to remain private, in which case these types of documents will not be available. But again, asking key questions during your interview can tell you a lot, such as how is the company doing against its goals for the year? Or what does product success look like and are you seeing that? Compensation for GCs in industry roles versus academic or clinical roles is generally significantly higher. But there are a lot of items to think about in terms of a total compensation package other than base salary. Quarterly and or annual bonuses are very typical at both startups and large corporations. It's important to understand if these are metric based and how they will be measured based on individual performance, team company performance, or both. At publicly traded companies, an employee stock purchase plan is typically available in which you may be eligible to purchase shares at a discount. Startups will often give new employees equity in the company, which can end up being very lucrative if the company succeeds. It's important to understand the vesting schedule in this case. In other words, how long do you have to work there before your shares vest? A typical arrangement is a four-year vesting schedule with 25% of your shares vesting each year on the anniversary of your start date. And of course, companies can offer any number of benefits that may be part of your compensation package as well. Everything from the standard health, dental, life insurance, to gym memberships, and free daycare. In taking a look at the 2018 professional status survey data, GCs are certainly receiving a variety of ancillary benefits. In general, large companies may be, able to, may be able to provide more robust healthcare plans, other insurance plans, and retirement savings programs, simply because they have more employees and are able to get better rates. Startups, however, may offer more creative benefits, like bringing in lunch and even dinner every day for their employees, or having pet-friendly offices. Now, when it comes to assessing the last category, which is potential for a new role to offer growth on a personal or professional level, I think it's helpful to consider that every opportunity can be viewed as a challenge and every challenge can be viewed as an opportunity. It's just a matter of how you choose to see it. Working at a startup is an excellent opportunity to get, on, to get in on the ground floor. If the company succeeds and has longevity, being an early employee puts you in the position to be a leader as the company continues to grow. As the company grows, you may find that your role changes over time and you have the opportunities to define what your career path within the company looks like and even the career path of future GCs that the company may hire. At a more established company that already employs a lot of GCs, there may be pretty, a pretty well-defined growth trajectory for GCs already and you can follow that or eventually try to expand out of that role and do other things at the company. If you are coming in as the first GC at a large established company, there is the risk of feeling a bit lost at first. It may be a challenge to educate others at the company what, about what a GC is and what a GC does, and you may need to do a lot of advocating for your value. But of course, this challenge comes with an opportunity as well. If you are, if you are successful at educating and advocating, you will be able to build new programs, products, and services. This Harvard Business Review study looked at the reasons people don't apply for positions, and not meeting all the qualifications is one of the most cited. This is particularly an issue for women, 
a fan of Hewlett Packard internal report that has been quoted in Lean In and the Confidence Code, found that women will only apply for a job when they meet 100% of the listed qualifications, but men are comfortable applying when they meet only 60% of them. Now, there are of course jobs in which some of the requirements are non-negotiable, but often, Job, job descriptions can be seen as general guides, not hard and fast rules. Even if you don't think you meet all the listed requirements, you may have other additional skills that will make you even more relevant for the position. So again, there is both a challenge and on the flip side, an opportunity to demonstrate in your interviews that you have transferable skills that will help fulfill the goals of the position. What if there's no job description at all? Sometimes companies will know they need to hire someone, but they haven't yet defined the role. Perhaps this is a genetic testing startup that knows they need someone with clinical genetics expertise, but hasn't yet thought through all the responsibilities of that role. Or a large company that is introducing a new product or service that will require a genetic counselor's expertise. Here you have the opportunity to really get in and define the role for yourself and for the company. You'll be given goals and you get to figure out how to accomplish them. And sometimes a company will not even know that they need you, yet. There won't be a position open. They haven't even dreamed up the role yet. You identify the need and approach them about filling it. Good targets for this are startups that just completed a funding round. You know they have cash and need to hire in order to grow. While a cold call can sometimes work as an initial contact, it's always best to leverage your personal connections and get an introduction. See if any of your LinkedIn contacts know someone at the company, or introduce yourself face-to-face -face at a conference. I have found the exhibit hall at the NSGC AEC or other genetics conferences to be excellent networking venues. So now we've got you thinking about all the many, many types of roles GCs can have in business. And you might even be thinking about roles that you would like to go after or create. But what if you're not quite ready to dive in? Consulting is an excellent way to get your feet wet while mitigating some of the risk. It's the way that I first made the migration from academia to industry. Maybe you start with a small project, doing a few extra hours of work each week, separate from your day job. You can be offering your services and proving your value to a company without either of you having to make the full commitment of an employer-employee relationship. You can get to know each other, see if it's a good fit. You may prove yourself so invaluable that you end up carving out a new full-time role for yourself. We hope that this webinar has served as a good introduction into the typical business life cycle and organizational structure, and that we've portrayed the many different roles GCs can play in business and how to go about pursuing or creating those roles. Don't miss out on the second and third webinars of this series. Which will, be, which will be deep dives into sales and marketing and the roles GCs can play in these specific areas. Please re reach out to any of us if you have questions or if you're considering a new career move and would like someone to bounce ideas off of. We'd love to chat. Thank you.